Hello and welcome to Data Research Labs. This tutorial covers how to interpret reports in My Test Case Manager. First up, an introduction. The Report tab is very important. You use it to visualize test cycles, to depict that testing is not a single pass, single dimensional event. Many people view software testing, step one, write all the test cases, step two, execute all the test cases. But that's not how it is. Rather, testing requires multiple builds that are tested across multiple cycles. The test case counts grow as each cycle adds more and more test cases, as you write more and more test cases. Each cycle uses the prior cycle tests for regression. And then finally the sprint ends or the feature is completed or the release arrives, whatever your end goal is, and then you're done. But testing is never just one and done. It's always cycles. You learn, write, execute, refine in your first cycle. Then in your second type of cycle, you learn, write, run some regression tests, rerun the tests you wrote here, some of them, all of them, it depends, and then refine and you cycle through several times as you're building up your test cases. Maybe you have 10 test cases written here in three days and then you get a couple of builds. So you rerun those 10 and add six more. So this is really how testing works. It's iterative. And the rest of this video is going to show you how to use the reports tab to communicate that up and out across the project team. You can use the report tab to visualize other factors also, such as the impact of blocks or the time savings versus risk when you're balancing the use of qualified passes or the actual test cycle execution times or the final release stability or the defects lists that you can email out. There's lots of ways you can use the reports tab. Next up, the report header. The header shows the three properties from the property worksheet, the company name, the project name, and the tested by, be it one person or if you common to limit it a whole list, whatever you put in gets displayed here for company project and tested by. It also shows the test cycle or test run number that is currently active and the total counts of test cases and defects. Next up, the test case counts snapshot graph. The test case count graphs are located on the left half of the page, one, two, three of them, directly below the report header and the snapshot is the top one right here. It is a single point in time chart. It's indicating that we're at test cycle number one and that we have 21 passes and one fail. For all test cases run this test cycle. There are five statuses represented in this chart, the same five that are represented everywhere. Pass is dark green, red is fail, yellow is blocked, blue is to do, and the lighter green is a qualified pass. So for the rest of these charts, for the rest of this presentation, we're going to run through examples. And this example number one here for the test case count snapshot graph, I look at it and I can tell that there are 16 qualified passes where we've effectively skipped and didn't run any test cases, which by the way, you'd never do on a cycle one. Let's assume this is a cycle two or three and that we're qualified passing forward the test case results from cycle one or two. Anyway, 16 qualified passes and three passes. So the downside is the risk. We didn't test these. We're relying on prior test cycle results and carrying them forward. The upside is that we skip these. We put in zero effort to spending time executing those tests. We only executed these tests. So it's a balancing act. And I can look at this chart and know that there is decisions being made to focus on these only and not the rest of them. Example number two, a whole bunch of blue to do's. To me, that tells me, oh, this is an early test cycle number one. The snapshot says that there's four test cases passed, one failed, and a whole boatload of 16 test cases that haven't been run yet. So this cycle's just getting started. And there's a bunch of tests that have to be done yet. If this were getting close to the end and there was that much blue, maybe those would all get flipped to 16 blocked, and then they would start a test cycle number two and there's a whole bunch of code missing or some big major bug that blocked all the rest of the test cases. You would never leave at the end of a test cycle a bunch of tests blue. You would make a decision to fail them all or tag them all as blocked, but you'd never leave them to do. So when I see a blue to do's, I know that it's still actively being tested. Example number three, a lot of red fails. That equals unstable instability. Sure, there's lots of green passes, that's good but I'm ignoring those, I'm focusing on the red. There's also two to-dos, but that's a small amount. There's, though, if this is the end of cycle number one, those should not be left blue. 
So maybe there's a little bit of testing to finish up. But the reds, that tells me that there's a high fail count and the build's not stable. And yeah, it's test cycle one. You just got the build. So I would anticipate a test cycle two and three and these reds would eventually start going down. Example number four, I'm focusing right in on all these yellows and that to me suggests instability. They're blocked cases, cases that can't be finished testing. You don't know if they're a fail, you don't know if they're passed, you just don't know, you couldn't run the test. So sure, there's lots of green passes, but don't focus on that. Focus on where the risk is, the yellow blocks. You can't, this is nowhere near releasability until decisions are made on this. Now, maybe you decide to make these a qualified pass even though they're yellow and can't be tested in the sense that you're going to skip them because maybe everybody agrees that functionality doesn't exist yet and it's not part of the release fine make that decision turn it from yellow to a green write in the test case some reasoning why and get your graph to where it needs to be either all greens or greens with light greens for the test cases next up test case counts trend graph test case counts trend is located right below the snapshot this graph is a trend over time. I look at this chart and know it's at cycle test cycle C6 or test run R6 if you wanted to label it differently. I notice that at each test cycle, the number of test cases is increasing and that's because we're writing more and more. And I also know this is mock data, it's not real. You'd never have all green. You'd have fails and qualified passes and other stuff going on. There's five statuses, they always stay the same between reports, so the test case counts, trend, or snapshot are the same. Got the rainbow action going on here. Pass is dark green, qualified pass light green, fails red, blocked is yellow, to do is light blue. Example number one is just a standard project S curve, typical in project management. Starts off slow, picks up fast in the middle, and then slows down at the end. It uh, tapers off over there there's some high bugs in the beginning a bunch of bugs in the middle and then it tapers off to nothing as you bring it home and close things out same with the blocks and then the qualified passes in this case they're just kind of consistent throughout example number two i look at this chart and know that there's a risk versus speed decision going on throughout all the test cycles once things got started there's a bunch of qualified passes going on these are test cases that weren't run now they weren't all qualified test passes, just some of them were. So it was a balancing act. Also note that this is test case counts, not time. If it were time, the qualified passes would be zero, but it's showing you the scope of how many qualified passes each test cycle were skipped, how many test cases were skipped. Example number three, maximum qualified passes. You'll notice that as the test cycles went on and time went on towards the end, there were a lot of test cases that were skipped and assumed to be okay, and only the really important stuff was test cases were executed at the end. So this particular project or mock data, they're minimizing the regression tests, which maybe that's okay on your project. But if it was a critical project, you wouldn't want to have that much exposure with qualified test cases. You want to have the dark green way up towards the top. And example number four for the test case counts trends. This is an unstable, no go. The red should be zero. You shouldn't have any fails that you're releasing with. You should make a decision. And if those reds really aren't critical or high, then make a decision to defer them or flip them to, well, that's a defect. This is a failing test case. So take that test case and say, eh, it's a qualified test on this last test cycle because we're making a decision to accept and skip that failing test case if you really want to. Otherwise, if it's too big of a deal to skip, then don't skip it. Do another test cycle. Kick the release back to the development to fix the bug. But I look at this and say, oh no, something has to happen. You can't release with red. And likewise with yellow. The yellow sh uh, blocked test cases should be zero. That's risk. If you haven't run the test case and it's yellow, well, <laughs> do you know if there's going to be a bug there or not? You don't. So if it's yellow or red, fix it. Deal with it. Don't release. Do another test cycle. If you must release, well, make a conscious decision and show and weigh that risk out with everyone and give visibility to it. And then the light green here, there's a bunch of risk there as well because you haven't retested that in a long time. It just went flat. And then these increase. So to me, this looks like an unstable no-go. If this dark green were way higher, then it might be a little bit better. But now you've got compound risk going on here. Skipped qualified past test cases. 
blocked test cases you haven't run and known failing test cases. So, uh, that's a no-go. There needs to be more test cycles and development has to do issue new builds to fix whatever's broken here. And example number five, the ideal close almost never happens. Here you have 100% past green regression tests. You've run through all the old test cases you built plus the new ones and 100% of the test cases passed on test cycle C6, whatever your latest build was. That's great. You're golden if everything passes on that last build. Next up, the defect counts snapshot graph. The three defect count graphs are located on the right half of the page directly below the report header. And the defect snapshot is the top graph. The snapshot graph is also a point in time chart. Here we can look at it and know that we're at test cycle C6. And we know that there are 14 closed defects, zero open, zero de uh, de defers, and everything looks good. There are three statuses. Red is open, which is bad. Light gray is deferred, which is okay. And dark gray is closed, which is good. Example number one. All closed is all good. Everything's gray. Nothing open, nothing deferred. This is what we want to see when we're ready to release. You could have some deferred too, that's fine, but you don't want any reds that are open when you're doing a release. Example number two, if there's lots of defers, it's like half of the defects are light gray, that's a bit shaky. A few defers are fine and normal. A lot of defers though, even if they're low or medium severity, that's kind of an indicator that maybe stuff's getting swept under the rug. So never and, and never allow higher critical fails to become defers. They shouldn't. You should leave those open unless you have vigorous debate on it before you flip something that's really critical to the defer bucket. But that I look at this chart and go, wow, it's a lot of defers. Either there's a lot of low and medium priority stuff that's not going to get fixed or something else is going on. Don't know which. Example number three. That's a lot of red. There's a lot of fails. You need to look into it. If it's an early cycle, cycle one, cycle two, and you're expecting six cycles, not a big deal because you're going to find a lot of stuff in the beginning. If it's a late cycle, late in the release, yeah, that might be a problem. And if it's your final cycle, <laughs> no, it's not. You're going to have to do a follow-up cycle because that's a lot of defects still open. Unless they're low priority and you're going to make a decision to defer, but then you're going to have to have a lot of discussion because that's a bunch of defects. So anyway, you have to discuss. When you see a lot of red, it depends whether it's a good or a bad thing. Next up, the defect counts trend graph. And the defects trend graph is located below the defect snapshot graph on the right side of the page. This graph is a trend over time. I can look at this and tell oh, we're at test cycle number six. I can see that at each test cycle, the number of defects has been increasing, but then it flattened out here as we got towards the end. And I also know this is artificial data because <laughs> At the end of every test cycle, everything's closed. Gee, that's perfect. Usually there's stuff that's open. And that red line there, that's a bug. I'm going to fix it. It's a border on the defects. There should be no borders. Fill only. There are three statuses on this trend graph for defects, just like the defect snapshot. Red's open, light gray is defer, dark gray is closed. Example number one for our defect trend graph, standard S-curve. Typical for project management, starts off slow, picks up speed, and then slows back down. Faster in the middle, high opens. There's also high opens typically in software in the beginning as well, but it tapers off as you get to the final cycles and things start to stabilize. And at the end, there are zero open reds and no low or moderate. There's, there's some defers though. It's low to moderate. There's not a lot of defers, light gray, and there's heavy dark grays. That's great. So this is a nice, nice project. Look at that and go, yeah. Example number two. This is an unstable project. I look at this. The reds, the opens, they just keep on growing. They never close. They're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's not a good sign. The defers are growing and growing, and, and the... <laughs> The closes are flattening out. That is not good. What is going on here? Are they taking lots of defects and just playing games with them and throwing them deferred? And then a bunch of really high severity ones they just can't get to and get them fixed? That is just a bad sign. And you see that in the project. This is test cycle six. This project's nowhere near ready to go. As a matter of fact, it's getting worse and worse and more and more unstable. It's definitely a no-go. And if anything, you need to stabilize it and stop. 
stop adding features and just focus on getting the reds back down to zero and analyze these light grays and see what's going on there. Is it okay or is there actually some reds that need to be pulled back out? Because if you let, just like technical debt, if you let these bugs grow and grow and grow, the quality of your app is going to go down. And the reds, of course, you got to get those to zero. So yeah, a trend graph like this makes me go, ooh. Unless, of course, we're expecting 20 cycles, then okay. That, then you're really just kind of in the middle of the curve. Still not great because you should be fixing these reds as you go along, not letting them grow too big, but anyway. Example number three. This has got to be gaming the system. The opens are all closed, the reds, so that's good. There's very little reds. But it looks like the defers, the light gray, were just swallowing up the reds. And maybe that's okay. Maybe they were all light, uh, low probability, priority, severity. But I don't know. I look at that and it's like, hmm, time to start asking some questions. The closed also is flattened out. You would expect the closed to pick up the dark gray and go to much higher. Here you are at the end of test cycle six and you have two thirds of your defects are deferred and one third are closed. That is something suspect there. Looks like maybe someone's gaming the system to try and hit the release. But I don't know, you have to look at the details to know for sure. Next up, the test case execution time trend. The execution time trend graph is located below the two test case counts graphs. This is also a trend across time report. I look at this report and know that we're at test cycle six. I know that each test cycle took one hour. <laughs> they're never, as fictitious data, they're never all the same. This is the fun part of using this test case tool, is tracking your time. So here in example number one, a typical project is going to look something like this. In cycle one, you're writing a bunch of test cases and executing some, so four or five hours. Test cycle number two, you're still writing test cases and you're executing the new ones plus the old ones, so it's taking more time. You're starting to understand, get new features. By the time you get to test cycle number three, maybe you're well into the sprint and you hit your third testing iteration and you really spend a lot of time with it. But then you've crested and by test cycle number four, maybe each test cycle is a couple of days, two or three days. And by test cycle number four, you're not writing any more test cases. You're just executing everything. And then by test cycle number five and six, you're getting really uber efficient. You can execute in half or a third the time it took you back here when you're first executing them. So you'll see this frequently when you're executing test cases. Other reasons five and six might be slow are maybe you took a chunk of the test cases and decided I'm going to do them qualify past and I'm not going to rerun them. And that's fine too if you make a calculated decision and believe that well I ran this block of test cases here, here, and here across four cycles. There's no point in running them here on the fifth and by the time you get to the sixth maybe you're only cherry picking some real high priority or high severity test cases and you're not running rest. That's another reason that you'd have a bell curve like that. So one reason you get more efficient at running the same cases. Another reason you're not running all the cases. And another reason you're only executing cases you're not writing and executing. So three reasons why it always gets faster the more cycles you do. Example number two, a front loaded project. This is a good project. It's fine. It means that there's heavy writing and executing of test cases up front in cycle number one, 25 hours, and then cycle number two it dropped to 15 hours, and then you got uber efficient. You're not writing cases anymore, you're just executing them. And maybe you're not executing all of them, maybe you are, and you're just efficient, whatever. It's, it's nice to see a front-loaded project. You've, sque you've tackled the risk up front, and things are smooth on the tail end. It's rare, enjoy it, thank the team for doing a good job. Okay, example number three. Oh, snap! You had minimal activity, cycles one, two, three, and four, and all of a sudden it exploded at the end. Now that can occur when there's no code release or the environment's not ready, databases aren't ready, whatever, and it's a slow project start, fine. Then really what you're saying is throw away C1, 2, 3, and 4. C5 is really your C1. That can happen. But if that's not the case and you can't find an obvious reason and it's just a slow start and everything's available back here, uh-oh. <laughs> You're in a world of hurt because you shouldn't be hitting all this risk. And here, you should have this bubble earlier so that you're tapering off. You're not going to, it's like, <laughs> it's like uh, merging onto the highway. If you merge onto the highway <laughs> at 30 and you got to get to 60, you ain't going to make it. If you merge at 60 or 65, you can easily slow down or speed up. 
but anyway, if you're here and you have all this work uh, and anything goes wrong, you don't have any buffer. So yeah, you don't. Uh. Next up, the releasability trend graph. This is located in the lower right of the defects section on the right hand side of the reports. This is located in the lower right of the defects section on the right hand side of the reports. This is also a trend over time report. I look at it and know that we're at test cycle number six, or test run number six. I know that each test cycle had one open showstopper red defect. So you shouldn't release because it's a showstopper. And I know that each had one open allowable that we could skip or allow to pass through defect. So it's obviously mock data. Bunch of stuff going on here I want to address. Number one, there's a bug in the tool. There should not be a 0.5 and 1.5. I'll fix it and release it. Uh, number two, that there's two statuses. There's light pink, which are open allowable defects that you can pass on through because they're low severity. And then anything that's not pass through allowable is a showstopper. You wouldn't release with it. So I didn't want to get into, is this low, medium, high, critical severity, priority, visibility, what does your company have? Uh, that's too much. I just want to focus on two states for the defects when you're tracking them. Can you release with it? Open allowable. Can you not release with it? Open stopper. So that is the two statuses. So this graph is very useful in situations where you're being pressured to release but are not quite yet ready. You can show the trend over time, and I'm going to show some examples coming up here, where the project is getting better or worse based on the defects and this color coding. And then rather, oh, I got to pause. There's a spider on the wall. Shit. Well, that's a bummer. The spider got away. That'll probably bite me in the middle of the night. Oh, well. Uh, so, oh, right. So rather than debating severities and priorities, you just preset them on the prior worksheet with the run, test run results log, and you're going to enter either showstopper or not. Example number one, this is a good release cycle. There's no bright red showstoppers at C6, so by test cycle C6, Good to go. The red showstopper trend goes up, that's normal, and it tapers off and goes down, that's good. The light pink, it goes up, the, the allowable defects, lows, mediums, and it tapers off and goes almost to nothing, down to one. That's all good, all those trends are good. That's the way we wanna see it. Example number two, an even better release. There's no red showstoppers for the last two test cycles. You get two test cycles in a row, especially if you're fully regression testing everything. That's fantastic. You know you have a good, solid, stable release. And especially if you fully regression test everything both times and you're doing exploratory testing in that last cycle, that is like gold standard because you've heavily exercised the system for two release or two test cycles and you found nothing new that's a showstopper. The uh, open allowable, yeah, there's some there. I mean, that'd be perfect if those went down to zero, but perfect is the enemy of good enough, and that's pretty darn good not having showstoppers. So all the trends are good. It's it's tough to do this, but that, that's high quality to have two zero defect test cycles, and a defect is the red showstoppers. The open allowable, we're not calling those a defect, quote unquote. It's lower medium severity. Anyway, this is a really good release. A set of test cycles leading up to a release at test cycle number C6. So a suggestion is at the beginning of a project, establish an agreement for the project team that for a release to occur, all test cases it must be a pass and all of the defects, the showstoppers, have to be at zero. And uh, let's see. And you can also, if you really want to push it, require that the final two test cycles have zero defects. So a lot of options there, but it's a good item. And that way you have a, a, an entire test cycle as a buffer or a hedge if you don't, if you require two cycles with nothing new found. It's a showstopper. Anyway, coming up with some kind of an agreement for your project team is a good idea. And then you release, then when it's crunch time, everyone already knows what the agreement is that no, there's too much red here. That needs to be zero. We can't release. That means we have to focus and fix these things and keep doing test cycles and getting new builds from development until nothing new is found. And the right time to do that is at the beginning of the project, but or as soon as you can thereafter, but don't wait until it's close to release time to start debating whether or not this is acceptable. Example number three, oh snap, an unstable set of test cycles. 
you need to just, ah, look at this. It, it gets worse, gets a little bit better, gets worse. You got to stop and stabilize. You can't just let it keep oscillating like that. The showstoppers are increasing. The allowable defects are increasing. I mean, you don't want to ignore the allowable. Sure, a few of them are good, but if the trend of open allowables is growing and the trend of showstoppers is growing, that's really bad. That That's like a runaway bad project. I worked on a project 1996 like that. It was awful. For about three or four months, it just got worse and worse, and the counts of defects got worse and worse, and they just kept throwing functionality at it. You need to stop, stabilize the framework, stabilize the core, stabilize all the code, fix all the defects, and then you can start adding stuff. But if it just keeps running like that, ugh. And finally, the optional defect list. The defect lists are located at the bottom of the report, below all the graphs. There are three sections, the defects currently open list, the defects closed since the last report list, and the defects closed remaining list. Now, what I typically do is whatever bug tracking system we're using, Jira or whatever, I use this whole spreadsheet, test case, my test case manager, as just a standalone little track my projects kind of a thing. And I want to put out a weekly email. So I pull out the defects from Jira and I just keep the description here. And as the week progresses, whatever I add that's new that's opened, I just paste it in here. If it goes to close that week and I haven't sent out the report, I move it from here down to this bucket and let it accumulate. And then when it's time to cut the report, I can ignore all of these because I've already reported on them. I can copy paste this, take a screenshot or copy paste the block, put it in my email and say, hey, here's what's been closed since the last status report. And then whatever's open, stuff from a week, two or three weeks ago, it's opened, it's important, it stays. And anything new that I found that hasn't yet been closed will be up here too. So these two lists I will typically put on a status report and sometimes on smaller projects. If I only have 20 or 30 total defects and working on it for a few weeks, then I'll just put the whole list on it. Or at the end, when I'm wrapping up, I'll put all three sets and just close out the project and have basically all those graphs that we went over before plus these sections in a nice wrap-up summary email for the project. And so filling out these sections is optional. I got ahead of myself and explained why I do it. It's for emailing status reports. But if you're not going to do that, don't bother filling out this report. Just use the graph section up above.